Cougs house. All right. The Houston Cougars are set to take off in the Big 12 this weekend with TCU, and there's three things they've got to do to come away with a victory. Let's get into them. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked on Cougs, the daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Ainsworth, here to break all things Cougs down for you. If I'm a little flustered or, uh, you know, things sound a little bit differently, I am recording before it's time to meet some folks at Meet the Teacher Night. So that's what we're doing here. But thank you all for stopping by to talk about the Cougs. If you're a U of H fan or just a hate who came and said bye, please be sure to subscribe down below. And that way we can lay us on the Cougs in your news feed each and every day. We appreciate you making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. That's where you found us. It is so good to see you again. Remember to subscribe to get to the next 250 mark. I think we're on our way to 1750. Hopefully we're getting there by Saturday. So make sure you subscribe to get us there and like and comment so we can give away something to someone liking commenting at the 1750 mark. If after talking about TCU today, you don't know what to say, tell us, tell us if macaroni salad actually counts as a salad. <sighs> it's a long discussion. All right. So today's episode, we are going to break down the three things that Houston needs to do to beat TCU this weekend and open up Big 12 play the right way. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is tell them how they have to start fast and why, what that means and why. Second, talk about taking advantage in the air, talk about how they can do that and why it's important to. And then third, they've got to, got to, got to stop the run. But first, let's jump in with our first key to victory. And for the video audience, you'll see it is the first thing, start fast and take out those mental mistakes now we all remember the rice game we said it was behind us but admittedly it's only kind of behind us um but in that rice game right houston was down 20 nothing before they really had a chance to catch their breath they only ran a handful of offensive plays the defense on the field the whole time and that's hard for anyone what rice had done was go with some tempo on offense kind of throw houston off a little bit punch him in the mouth and it took a while for houston to get up off the mat and punch them back tcu has the potential to start the same way, unfortunately, if Houston's not ready to come out the gates. Against Colorado, TCU ran 80 plays from scrimmage, and in a blowout where they're trying to waste the clock at the end against Nichols State, they ran 71. For reference, Houston ran 78 total plays in the double overtime loss to Rice, right? So with a whole couple of overtimes extra, they ran less plays against Rice than TCU ran against Boulder. They're playing a much faster pace and tempo out there. It's a Sunny Dyke special, the way he does things. Got to be ready for that. Um, for reference, they also ran less plays against UTSA. UTSA ran their own version of tempo, and they ran 74 plays. So Houston's defense ran 74 plays against them, I should say, and that's still less than what TCU put up against Boulder. Um, so if Boulder jumped out to a big lead and kind of held on to it, I kind of think that's the blueprint for Houston as well. They're going to hit them in the mouth early and be able to go tit for tat with them along the way after that. Um, TCU did eventually take a late lead in that game, but we saw that when Boulder struck first, right, that meant that over the course of the game, they got away with, um, mm, they kind of stunned them, right? They kind of stunned them and it didn't look like TCU knew what they were doing. Now, I will say that part of me that says this is because since the rice game we've heard one thing or two things over and over and over again one that game was unacceptable well okay it's in the past it's unacceptable it's gone flush it down the drain but if it's unacceptable to start that slow then you have to make sure you don't start that slow again so as we look for the keys to victory the reason is the first one is because it's the most important they need to start early, they need to start fast, and they need to take out those mental mistakes because you can't just say those kinds of things against Rice and then come back to the football game the next week and say, oh, we started slow again. Oh, we made the same mental mistakes again. Oh, then and then and it doesn't work that way, right? It doesn't work that way if you really are saying in the Rice game, it was a trap game, you look to the next week, et cetera, this is that next game. If you're Holgerson, Burchette, Belk, whomever coaching, this is that next game you got to be ready for. If you're Nelson Caesar or 
Sam Brown in the postgame saying, like, look, I think we had some guys that did that as leaders of that locker room. And I know Sam Brown's not a captain, but he surely is playing like one. Um, this is the kind of moment where it's like, okay, guys, like we need to be ready to go. We're dialed in. Now, there's plenty of reasons to do that. This is the opening of the Big 12. It's a big weekend on campus doing it up. They're going to announce on uh, this early this Friday morning. They're announcing Friday afternoon a bunch of stuff about the football operations building that they're building. Um, so more on that to come, obviously. Um, they're also, for what it's worth, doing like big for the city of Houston kind of stuff one day on Saturday. Um, they're really doing this up. You have that kind of stuff to get excited for. You ought to have a good crowd. First on the Big 12, I've been asked to be in a Big 12 and a power conference for a long time. This is your shot, period, right? Um, third, and I, I probably read more into this than others, but TCU put out some locker room material, in my opinion, when they released that they're doing a new look on their helmets for the Houston game. It's like a matte purple, the silver frog, whatever. The deal that got me is that in this purple hum with a silver frog, their whole marketing campaign has UGK in the background. Now, UGK, I guess originally is technically from Port Arthur, but I would point out is like Houston rap legend, right? Like that is like the folklore of the folklore. Pimp C and Bum B were like the 90s. And frankly, being from Port Arthur, they were good in North Houston and South Houston in a way that not every Houston group was, right? Um, TCU in the Metroplex, not even in Dallas, and just in the Metroplex, stealing city city rap from Houston, like very regional context rap, bugs me. And I know that that's very much mean. You're probably going to comment the thing down below about how I'm being too sensitive or whatever, and maybe I am. It bugs me. Okay, so I would move on from that. Um, I say that that's bulletin board material. Um, you're getting up to play against a team that, I guess, didn't win the conference last year, but certainly the most nationally recognized team in the conference last year. They don't win the college football playoff final. They don't want to talk about that game, but they got shellacked in that one. And for what it's worth, if you want people to forget you lost to Rice, you beat TCU on national television, and they will, right? People will be talking about how Houston's in the Big 12 now. They'll be talking about how, oh, TCU is not the Big 12. Like, What's Houston doing? What's this noise they're making, et cetera? This will do a lot of quieting of the crowd. And Houston's got some of the guys to do it. We talked in the summertime. We talked over the offseason about all the additions made to this roster. I think it's a pretty strong look at what they could be doing now i do want to talk from the second segment about how they can do that schematically by taking advantage of some stuff in the air but first we're talking about building a good houston football team and program to compete in the big 12 and eventually win this thing outright and if you're building your own team we're going to talk about building it at linkedin jobs because these days every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business you want to be 100 percent certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Make sure that you go to LinkedIn.com and look for guys that might be a starting quarterback caliber guy like a Donovan Smith or maybe add 200 plus yards in the receiving game like Sam Brown has done from West Virginia, right? Add guys to your roster in your business that can make the same kind of impact that coups are making on the football field. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lifetime college. That's linkedin.com slash lifetime college. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Now, I mentioned, and we're going fast here, but that's the way it goes on Friday. I know you got things to get to and get to go, you know, watch stuff about the football operations building, things like that. But I want to take a moment to talk about scheme because TCU, I think, has, uh, in their growth to a Power 5 program, was vaunted for their defense, right? The 425 Gary Patterson kind of reinvented college football defense with it. And they look a lot different now. Um, obviously, Sonny Dykes is not a defensive guy. We talked some throughout this week about the connections he and Olgerson have for being in the offensive staff with Leach and the air raid connections there. Um, Sonny has kind of gone his own path, and Nate's kind of found his own path. And they will actually run the ball now more than they ever have. But with that said, neither is the defensive guy, right? Doug Belk is our defensive guy. And over there, they actually have Tulsa's former staff, all the way up to Gillespie as their DC, and they run the odd stack, or the 3-3-5 stack. And what we've seen thus far actually makes me think there are big, big windows in the passing game. I want to start first with what I imagine TCU is looking at on film after watching that Rice game. And when Houston got it rolling, after going down 28 nothing. Right, they reeled off 35 unanswered points. And that Houston offense, which I would argue Dana Holgerson was calling, 
that Houston offense did a lot of quarterback run in the short yardage stuff. Specifically, in short yardage, they would have pre-snap reads. I know he's going to run the ball or pass the ball based on box counts. It looked like to me it was if they had a positive advantage, meaning they had an extra hat in the run game, he'd keep it. And if they had even or less, he'd toss it. Neither here nor there. Um, I'm not in the locker room with them, right, coaching that up. But it did look like they ran that ball a lot with Donovan Smith and his power run game behind it. He doesn't have the speed that I think we might have thought he was going to bring from Texas Tech, but he's a little more accurate, and frankly, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I see you nodding. You're taking the same thing. Um, so I anticipate TCU doing some more things in short yard situations, especially like second and six, third and three. It was kind of weird down. Third and four, I think, is a kind of a 50-50 down right, where you don't know what's going to happen. I could see them selling out on stopping the run because Donovan Smith is such a strong runner. And in the 3-3-5, that means you leave some passing windows so, 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 so open. Specifically, Colorado exploited with Shador, Shador Sanders' mobility, the fact that they opened up the middle of the field. Across the middle of the field as a whole, uh, in deep yard situations, Shador Sanders was two for two in the middle, deep middle. In intermediate, so the 10 to 20 yard range, he was six of eight. In the short yardage range, I mean, in the positive side, in the 10 yard, zero to 10 yards, he was eight of eight. And he threw eight middle screens as well. Three of the four touchdowns that Colorado Boulder threw were also over the middle. Um, and I think, I guess one of them was a screen pass that went up the middle, right? But you feel me on that, right? This is suddenly looking like the vulnerable spot here. And schematically, it actually makes sense because in a 3 3 5, if you're going to be containing or, you know, sending pressure at a quarterback with your linebacker guys, that kind of leaves the Mike linebacker there on an island to try and take away that middle. And if you kind of level him out, I mean, put a guy above him, a guy below him, the safeties or slot corners have a lot of ground to cover on your slot receivers. And suddenly the Mike linebacker is kind of left out to dry. That big, big hole in the middle is created by putting too much on that guy's plate. Now TCU is gambling that they'll get to your quarterback before those guys get open if they press and bump and run. And if Houston finds success in that window, in that area, you might see more press coverage. You might see more what I call walling coverage, where like defensive backs straight up put their back to the ball just to make sure that they don't let a guy inside very easily and those kinds of things, just to slow Houston's receivers down. And again, they're giving themselves time to get after the quarterback. Donna Smith has taken sacks instead of throwing the ball away, which um, he hadn't thrown the ball out of bounds yet for it either. And I guess the perfect thing would be the Tom Brady move. We throw it out of bounds, right? Um, but he's not throwing to the wrong team. He only that one time, and he got hit when he did it. I'll, I'll take those odds right now. Um, if I look at what Houston can do to exploit that, I look at first slot receiver from Joseph Manjack. He is a unique slot receiver. I think we take advantage of him and don't really recognize how unique he is in that role. But at you know, 6'3", 6'4", 215, he and frankly his backup, Josh Cobb as well, are both giants for the slot receiver position and create immediate mismatches with your typical slot corners, right? Um, that, to me, indicates that they could get a lot of catches since it's not a fantasy show by any stretch. There's not college fantasy in the same kind of industry that there is at the pro level. But Joseph Manjack will put up some fantasy points this weekend if things break that way. right? The other thing I think you'll see, because we saw Dana Holton run to the offense last week, is once Dana has found ways to open that up, I mean, they catch a beat on what is sending, what outside linebacker, and then you can have the slot on that side, run some sort of an inward breaking route, right? Those are things college coaches will pick up over the course of the game based on what they pick up as the game plan this week. So it might not happen in the first quarter unless they get it right, right? Um, but they'll kind of, you know, toy and trial and error until they figure something out there. Um, once they kind of figure that out, you could see them run some sort of a flex flip where you put Matthew Golden in that slot and run a little bit deeper kind of because he's faster. <laughs> Again, we talked in the first thing about Sam Brown playing like a captain. Sam Brown is having a fantastic year. Do you put him in there because he seems to have sure hands, right, in those kind of situations? Do you put a speed guy like Boogie Johnson? Because suddenly Boogie Johnson's feet in that spot, I mean, he is running away from a down safety and a linebacker. They're not catching him. If you can get him open to those spots, what does he do once he catches the football? Um, lots of options there. Um, I wonder if the truth, the best option is if you throw it between the Mike linebacker and the middle free safety in that window, with Sam Brown for a jump ball, I feel fairly confident, Sam, in those instances. I feel fairly confident Matthew doing a lot of things, too. But Sam has just had such a great year to start that I feel like that's where you're going to see a lot of balls completed. The shame in this is, to this point, although it's not actually broken down that way uh, analytically, 
I previously had a better, I thought that Donovan Smith threw better on the edges. And this defense kind of takes that away. It makes you put the ball in the middle. Um, and again, that's because that's where the pressure is coming from. It's those two outside linebackers and three, three, five stack doing something uh, towards coming after your quarterback, right? And so with that said, or I guess there's some sort of rotation and that gets complex coverage, stuff like that. But um, for the time being, that would not necessarily, like, I wouldn't assume that played to his strengths a month ago. However, in the first two games, I actually think that he's put the ball in the middle as well as he on the outside. And I wonder if that's what you're going to see. As far as personnel goes, they know they can frustrate Matthew Golden, who's shown that he's been frustrated at times this year by double covering him or locking up low and high. The guy, I think, gets that call for them is a kid named Josh Newton. He's their most touted corner. Um, he covered Travis Hunter when they played Colorado, and he did you know, all kinds of stuff. And I think that's fine. Josh is a very good football player. It's a, I'd pick Matthew Golden in the matchup, but that's neither here nor there because the truth is, is that we saw against Boulder, like, I keep saying Boulder, Colorado, um, that once they had that, like, taken away Travis Hunter with Josh Newton and someone over the top or whatever, that opened up a lot of stuff for other guys. And that's when you, again, see Manjack and Brown and Cobb and Boogie and these other guys stepping into those roles and making big plays if they can keep that rolling. For what it's worth, on the pro football uh, pro football focus analytics, the slot corners and down safeties had, relatively speaking, bad games in both uh, Colorado and Nickel State. Again, it's relative to what the rest of the team did because obviously they blew out Nickel State. It's like, you know, whatever. Um, but I think that's important to keep in mind here when you think about, like, what parts of the field will have bubbles and holes in them for Houston to take advantage of. Every defense has flaws. I don't mean to say that there's any that don't. I mean to say that Houston's won't. Right, but in the kind of game that I expect it to be, which is a track meet, I mean a track meet, track meet, finding those bubbles and continuing to hit them will be very, very important. And frankly, I'm an offensive guy. Like, let's run the score. Let's make this thing fun. <laughs> um, so that's what I see happening there. If I'm looking at what Houston's defense has to do, I would just say before we jump into our third segment, that's the kind of thing you might feel like you could say every week, and that is to stop. The run, however, I mentioned this thing being a track meet. And if you also think it's going to be a track meet, I'm going to tell you to head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on because FanDuel is America's number one sports book. You get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get $5, can bet $5, you get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. I'm a big fan of YouTube TV these days. Um, they've got the over-under slightly moving up over the course of the week. It started off at 60.5. Now it's 63.5. Um, I'm thinking that thing continues to move up up, to, up until game time because, frankly, I think more people look at this, more people realize, oh, these two offenses and offensive minds, if Dana's calling the plays, will be able to take advantage of the other defenses. I'm saying take the over in that. I'm saying take the coups. They got it at a plus seven. It's definitely closer than that. Plus seven and a half. I think definitely closer than that. So that's what I'm saying with this game. I'm telling you to do it at FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you don't want to miss. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right, so we're going to talk about the last bullet point here as far as my three things they've got to do, three keys to victory, and that is to stop the run with a six-man box. Now, obviously, stop the run is the kind of thing, Parker, you could say every week, right? Like, I, yeah, you're shaking your head like, Parker's stupid. They say this every week, you know, stop the run, et cetera. One, it looks like it's still up in the air about whether or not Dot and Wonquo and uh, Cedric Williams, if they'll be back or not. Um, if they're back, I think Houston's in business. If not becomes imperative that they work to stop the guys with just that six-man box. Um, if you look at what TC was able to do and what, frankly, Sonny Dykes has been able to do since he left Texas Tech in the late aughts, um, it, it's been a lot more predicated on since he had some failures at Cal running the football because when they just were passing it, they didn't have any balance, and that was defensive key, key on and whatever, and da-da-da. Specifically right now, Imani Bailey is really turning it up. He's really loving those A gaps and falling out. So you hit the A gap and then slowly start to work your way out of the box as you go from level to level of the defense. Um, and to me, that means Houston's got to really pinch those gaps with those six guys 
at the point of attack. They don't necessarily do a ton of outside stuff, sweeps, tosses, etc. But they do, for what it's worth, um, they do a bunch of powers and zones and stuff like that that hit again those inside gaps and fall out over the course of the defense. Um, that means that the nose tackles and defense tackles will have their work cut out for them. They're going to be dealing with a lot of double teams and pullers and kickouts and traps and those kinds of things. But they got to eat those up to let linebackers like Malik Robinson fill holes and take out the running back at the line of scrimmage or in that two-yard window, unless it's obviously second and goal from the two or something, right? Like, that's what's got to happen because once you start having to break your tendencies or break your rules to pull other guys in the box up to run, then Sonny Dyke's going to have a field day, right? Chandler Morris is a good quarterback. He's a running quarterback, a true dual threat quarterback, but he's he's a good quarterback that will make you pay once you have to break the box and send more guys into it. Um, I think they've got the guys to do that they have to. The thing is not to run with six. That means they can tr- make a true coverage five on five outside, you know, man up single high, play with some zone coverage and some whole stuff. They can really take advantage of having man for man out there and playing around more than man for man out there. Um, so that's what I would say Houston's got to do is fill those voids, fill those gaps, take up the inside stuff with their defense line and linebackers, keep things out. Uh, Colorado During the Colorado game, the TCU Horn Frogs had a lot of success with both Mon Bailey, Monty Bailey and Trey Sanders hitting the A gap and then slowly falling out on the right side of the field. And then against Nickel State, they pretty much kept them both A gaps. So again, that's the interior nose tackles, defense tackles. Which is why I opened this segment saying Dot Nwankwo is healthy to go. It's a lot better news for Houston because we know the disruption that he has in those gaps. He eats those blocks. He doesn't move backwards. He makes plays without making tackles. Um, really, really important to hit those. Even taking out their 74-yard run, um, the rest of their carries, it was so even taking out the 74-yard run, just taking that single play off, the A gap, the right A gap specific offense is right, so defense and left A gap specifically. Um, has the second most yards of any spot. Again, that's taking off 74 yards, still the second most by just a yard, right? That's the kind of faith they have in that right side of the offensive line and their center. So it's really, really important to keep that area shut down and take that away. Now, <laughs> if they don't, if something happens and they don't, um, I think the first fix is to pull the boundary safety down tight of the box and bump linebackers over to the field side. So you kind of inf- Function will have what feels more like a 4-3. And then the uh, the classic thing you see Sonny Dykes do when he sees that happening is he puts his formations into the boundary. And by formations into the boundary, I mean they'll put like three receivers on the short side of the field and leave one guy one-on-one and kind of make you make a decision. Are we going to cover these guys up and put all of our coverage guys into the boundary side? And then we have like lesser coverage athletes in the giant space that is the field side or what have you. It's a little counterintuitive because you typically want your best athletes out there with more space to run around as an offense. He's making you toy with, toying with you a little bit. Um, I think that's just a chess game that if if Houston's got to get into, they got to get into because they've got to stop the run game in this contest for sure. I do think it's going to be a high-scoring contest, though. So when like TC reels off a drive where they have a couple different 15-yard runs and score at the end of it, like it's going to happen. They have a really talented offense and a really good offensive coach. We can't hang out like they practice too. They're going to score too. I'm predicting, right? I'm predicting that this football game is 42 to 38. Good guys. I think Houston pulls it off in the city for the city with their first game in the Big 12. I think Houston has looked forward to this game for a long time. Um, not TCU specifically, but opening the Big 12. And in the short term, the more micro sense, they've mentioned they've been looking at this game for two weeks since they're looking at Rice. I think there's a lot of guys pissed off. I think you saw when you saw players going to the radio shows with Dana and kind of showing their you know various levels of support for Dana. Um, you had Tank Dell tweeting out about Tank about Dana Hogan being the goat, right? I mean, like people coming out of the woodworks, like, no, we support our guy. Um, I think that kind of vitriol, motivation, fuel, whatever pushes Houston over the edge a little bit. I also, for its worth, and this is not. To say it's not worth winning the football game. It doesn't mean like it's not a worthwhile win. I don't think TCU is the kind of program that they've been last year for sure. They're not my pick to win the Big 12. Obviously, my want to win the Big 12 would be Houston. But if I were a gambling person, they would not be my pick to win the Big 12. The TCU would not be my pick to win the Big 12 either. 
Um, yes, I would like, yes, people are, yeah, yeah, I can see you commenting. I would like to see someone in the Big 12. Sorry. Um, but if I were a gambler, I wouldn't be picking TCU either. Um, so, again, I think in 42 to 38 Cougs, 48 to 32 good guys. Um, that does put us well over the over. So make sure you hammer that home. And then obviously that Houston plus seven and a half is looking pretty sweet if they went out right. Right. Now, if you have a prediction, comment down below or find me on social media at Painsworth512, P A I N S W R T H 512, on Twitter, Instagram, and all your favorite social media handles. We have like, all things Houston Cougars. I got the Astros down there because they got a playoff push coming up. The Rockets are in a world of hurt, but I'm willing to talk about that too if you want to. The Houston Texans say they're going to play Tank Dell more. We can talk about Texans as well. All things Houston, even the Cougar volleyball team. Let's go talk Cougar volleyball. It's fun too. Find me on social media to do all of those things. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. Locked On Cougs is a proud of the Locked On Podcast Network, and that means your team every day. Go Cougs.